Discretionary listener participation is advised for the following pro wrestling podcast. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Stick to Wrestling. My name is John McAdam, this is Stick to Wrestling. It is a classic weekly wrestling podcast where we mostly talk about wrestling from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I bought a book on podcasting that said doing that every week is very important, so bear with me, please. All right. I, I, this book is obviously gospel. I have to do whatever it says. So anyway, this is Stick to Wrestling. Give us 60 minutes, and perhaps indeed we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. A couple of things. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, search John McAdam and follow the guy with the Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar. Uh, you are definitely – Invited to join our Facebook page, uh, just search Stick to Wrestling on Facebook, ask to join, and you're in. It's a cool group where we talk about cool things. We last recorded January 1st, 19, uh, 2019, listen to me, 2023. It is now January 11th, 2023, and I still have that goddamn cold. This thing is, seems like it's not going anywhere. Before I get rolling, first of all, Steve Generelli is not here today because we are not recording on our usual spot because of Lou Kippelman having flooding issues in the area he lives in. I've done it privately, but Lou, public shout out. I hope everything is well with you and your home. I once had a wet basement. And it was the big pain in the ass, and I can only imagine. Yeah, that's nothing compared to what you're going through. Another person I want to thank, I want to thank everyone in the Facebook group because we're having another Facebook group themed podcast where we take questions about 1998 and I want to bring on my guest Thomas Bain Thomas you're always great on the show and I really appreciate you coming on on a pinch where our recording has been up in the air because of Lou's situation and thanks for coming on with with very little notice I appreciate it John also um, shout out to our producer Lou Kippelman hopefully everything is maintaining or hopefully drying out at this point in time and the, the weather has just been incredible in terms of the amount of rain they get for that area for this you know time of decade i guess you would say it it just might be a once in a century type of storm out there i'm not quite sure but it certainly seems that way yeah it, it seems that way based on everything i've read and the the photographs are, are not looking good so we're all publicly wishing lou the best you know i live out here in new hampshire and i'm right on the mass border I'm about a half an hour away from Boston, and we, I mean, the winters here are long, all right, and, but all you have to do is stay inside. It's snowing if you have a blizzard or whatever. I'm lucky, Thomas. We don't have floods. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have earthquakes. None of that. Yeah, uh, same thing for me out here uh, in West Virginia. What will happen is, like, it, it, it's pretty much just perpetually gray from <laughs> November through, you know, baseball season. And you're, you know, God bless you if you have a white or a gray colored car because it's just covered in soot and ash from the road trucks all winter long. So it, it's really just a, it, it's the definition of a dreary winter out here. But we don't really get the the nor'easters as you guys get, or the the perpetual rain, the the droughts, the earthquakes, everything else that, that Lou gets out west. So it, it's a mixed bag, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I remember a long time ago being on the phone with Dave Meltzer. And this is, I want to say, 88, 89. I hear this this rumbling in the background. I'm like, what the hell is that? He's like, oh, it's just an earthquake. Are you kidding me? I would lose 10 pounds immediately if I was stuck in the middle of an earthquake. Uh, he just shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> oh, it's just an earthquake. So am I uh, the lead-in for Jim Cattori to come on now, John, or what are we doing here? <laughs> we are doing a mailbag from 1988. I cannot believe not 1988. 98 we are doing a mailbag from i can't believe that year is 25 years in the rear view time goes by way faster as you get older thomas i would like you as the guest to to answer the first question to pick one out and let's do this okay let me pull up the mailbag here this is from nicholas Coletus. am i saying that right john He's i think it's coliatus in the show Coliotis, yeah, I, okay and Nicholas was supposed to be the guest this week. <laughs> he's, I think he's going to well, be the guest next week. Well, to hell with him, then. He should have been on here then. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'll answer Nicholas's question. He asks, what was the exact moment that turned that you as a fan had since the tide had turned in the Monday Night War? 
and it appeared that the WWF was going to come out on top. He answered the Steve Austin, Mike Tyson pull apart, which I believe was the night after the Royal Rumble. See, I have two questions, two answers to this, actually. One is from the WCW perspective. One is from the WWF perspective. In late 1997, after Bret Hart had defected, things had, you know, were turning around for the WWF, but there was a big state of flux because Bret was coming to WCW. After Starcade 97, with the Sting Hogan, call it a screw job finish because it was protecting Hogan's ego, whatever it was, it was completely botched. At that moment, I thought the WWF had a, had a horse in the race. It wasn't until after WrestleMania, more so to that point, the Vince McMahon, Steve Austin, uh, quote unquote, match on Monday Night Raw, which I believe, you know, in hindsight, was the catalyst to end the 83 week run. That's when I thought the tide had turned. I didn't really, when I thought this answer, I didn't realize that was the actual time that the, uh, the ratings were uh, turned back to AWS. But to me, that was when the tide began to turn. Right, that moment right there. Because to that point, you still had what was going to happen. You still had Shawn Michaels as the champion. You still had Steve Austin chasing him. You had The Undertaker with Kane. You had DX in flux. You had a lot of things. The Rock hadn't made his way yet to being the, the megastar that he was. There were a lot of unanswered questions in the WWF. But I think Vince McMahon putting himself out there, not only as an owner, but as the lead heel and a main character was what brought that out to become the, the, the tide turning moment, John. Well, Thomas, I'm like you. I kind of have two answers to this question, and it's a really good question. Number one, I thought the tide had really turned, and, and I mean, this almost has turned into a cliche, but cliches become such because there's a lot of truth to them. The finger poke of doom with Hogan and Nash. I, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, they, this company just pissed everyone off. And to this day, Hogan, Nash, Bischoff, all of them still deny that they had done anything wrong. And you are just you're just being completely deaf when you do that. How many people have to tell you that that's when I stopped watching WCW in order for you to believe it? But the the second answer to this, Nicholas, is really when I first heard that WCW was was actually being not being sold uh, let me take that back when I first heard that WCW was folding and being sold to the WWF um and I say that because WCW was in a way better spot in early 2001 than they were in like 1992, 1993, 1994. Uh, maybe not 94, but let's throw 91 in there. I mean, they looked like they were never going to be any kind of a threat to the WWF. I, I, I was stunned in the late 90s when WCW uh, became number one. And, and I, I've always said, you know, if they could do it once, they could do it again. They could rebound as long as they were in business and they weren't in business any longer. So that eliminated that possibility. But I, I will always maintain that when WCW closed down March 2021, 2001, I'm getting really bad with numbers on this podcast. When they when they finally shut down 2001, that's when it became unsalvageable. It was always fixable before they just gave up on it yeah and I, and I think too when you look at what kevin nash has said kevin nash's go-to has always been about the finger poke of doom was sean michaels and triple h did the same exact thing on raw about a year and a half prior the one thing that isn't mentioned is a it was for the european championship and b it was in the middle of the show it did not close the show it did not have a buildup to it for the entire two hours. It was, you're going to defend the belt against Triple H, blah, 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 blah. Michaels lays down. He's the new champion. And then Jim Ross sells it as old DX, you know, put the screws over on Sergeant Slaughter. It was just a, a primary setback to an angle between Triple H and Sergeant Slaughter, a, a mid-card angle. It wasn't the WCW big gold belt that had been just taken away from Goldberg and his 170-somewhat you know, match winning streak, quote-unquote. So they kind of devalued the entire main event, seemed the finger poke of doom, 
and to compare it to the what Triple H and Shawn Michaels did is absolutely ridiculous. Thomas, I had to stop and jog my memory as far as what thing between Triple H and Shawn Michaels. Oh, yeah, that little thing they did on Raw that didn't mean anything. They never teased that there was heat between Michaels and Triple H. It was that Sergeant Slaughter was forcing them to wrestle, and yes, they screwed over Sergeant Slaughter. I mean, this is not apples to oranges. It's apples to anvils. Right, and when you look at I I think... To your answer, back in you know the finger poke of doom, to me, you had already had The Rock turn heel and win the WWF title. You had already established Mankind as a main event guy. Undertaker was there, obviously. Steve Austin was there, obviously. Triple H was right there at the cusp. By that point, the, you know, the very end of 98, early 99, I, I think the ship had sailed already on this Monday Night War, in my person. And, and yeah, hindsight, you know, 25 years in the future is always going to be 2020. But I, I think the writing was on the wall well before that. And I, I, I can't. I got to go back to it's because Vince McMahon became an everyday character, not just an announcer or a figurehead. I, I think there's there's a lot of it, but I, I just want to share a memory. I remember when Rocky Maivia turned heel and he started arrogantly ref- referring to himself as The Rock, and it cracked me up the first time he did it, and now it, it just means nothing. He's The Rock. But, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, everything came together. Uh, you know, they had a, Vince Russo at this point was a really good writer, kids. I hate to break the news. Yes, he had Vince McMahon as a filter, and that matters, but he had a lot of good ideas that went over well, especially the feud between Vince McMahon and Steve Austin. And it was, you know, it's like everything else, Thomas. I will go back and look at a Raw from 98, 99, 2000, and it does not hold up well. It doesn't always hold up well. But that doesn't matter. What matters is I loved it during those years. Every Monday night, I would watch Raw, and I would be entertained, and so would be uh, about another 5 million people. And the thing about it, too, was it was car crash TV back then. And by that, what I mean is there was something different happening every three to four minutes. Yes. Now, I I don't watch Raw or SmackDown regularly by any means, maybe the big pay per views. But the difference between Raw today, a three-hour Raw versus a two-hour Raw back in the late 90s is this. You had maybe anywhere from 35 to 40 different competitors featured in some capacity on Raw during the Russo era. Everybody had something to do. Now, you go to a three-hour Raw now, you might have 18 to 24 maybe. Now, there is, there is good camp and bad camp with all of this. On, on the good side, you're saying, well, you're establishing your stars, you're, you're, you're giving the people what they want, more main event talent. But at the same time, you're not building anything. Back then, you could have eight guys viably in the main event. Because when you think about it, when you look at when the big show came in, when Chris Jericho came in, when Chris Benoit came in, they didn't go to the top of the card immediately. But at the same time, you didn't think they were wasted. Because they were prominently on television, they were still beating upper mid-card guys, and you were seeing them every week. If that were to happen in this day and age where there was an influx of talent, they'd be lost in the shuffle. So I think, to an extent, the Attitude Era was better for for wrestling fans in general than, than it is today. The fourth episode of Stick to Wrestling was titled The Territories Are Dead and They Are Never Coming Back, and they're not. But this, that's the thing I miss the most about the territories. You would have, you would have guys cycle in and out and they, everything was kept fresh. And to me, it was better wrestling. I know it's never coming back because of technology. That's just the way it is. But territories used to take care of that. And I agree with your point. You know, the WWF could use that B show that they have, you know, just have it on late night on USA Network where they get some new talent over. But anyway, this leads into a question from Ryan Alajo. In January 1998, Nitro became the first show to go three hours. A practice that still goes on to this day. What do you think of three hour shows at that time? Personally, I thought it was too long and I still do. Ryan, I wholeheartedly agree with you. 
I can even go a step further. I mean, when I remember when I first, not even when I first, when the 605 WTBS show was on back in the 80s. Towards the end of that show, even I, wrestling mega fan that I was, was getting a little sick of sitting there watching wrestling. I was, I guess it's all what you're used to. I was used to the one hour Channel 56 wrestling. Now I've got two hours and it starts to feel long. Even the earliest pay-per-views, which generally went two and a half hours, two hours and 40 minutes, um, and we're, we're talking, you know, the, the top matches the promotion can possibly give us. Towards the end of those, I felt like things were running long. So a, a three hour, just everyday raw that, or nitro that airs, in my opinion, it's just way too long. It's impossible to sit through the entire thing, and I have not done so in at least 20 years. Thomas, that, that was my long winded response. What's yours? I 100% agree with you on this one, John. It's going to be a pretty quick answer for me, hopefully. But once they announced that in 98 or 99, whenever it was, that uh, Night Show was going to be three hours, I, I kind of went, because eh, like you said, you're conditioned to think three hours of wrestling programming is, is pay-per-view quality, for lack of a better term. Yeah. So you're going to get you know, your, your 15-minute matches. You're going to have your angle blow off everything else. To get to three hours, you can't just have three hours of squash match, because someone will, especially during the, the Monday Night War, someone will turn the channel. So what happens is you have their main event, like at the top of the hour, you'll have Hulk Hogan come out, you'll have Kevin Nash come out, you'll have Roddy Piper come out, and they will just suck the momentum of the crowd dry for 10 to 12 minutes until the quarter hour comes in, and then you'll have another cruiserweight match or an Eddie Guerrero match. It really took the wind out of the, of the sails of the momentum of the program, I think. Two hours, I think, is optimal because one hour, again, gets back to the B show sort of thing. You're just it, it, one hour, it becomes more of a recap show. Where two hours, you can get you know ninety minutes of new stuff, half hour. Of, this is what you missed last week, and this is what we're building up to for this week. So I think two is the good time. Three, I think, you could do three on a raw, maybe once a year, maybe the maybe the raw to WrestleMania. You say this is a one-time only three-hour Monday Night Raw extravaganza. You bring out the Hall of Famers. You, you, you debut a couple of people there from NXT or from out of the company. You get all that going without kind of car crashing, like I said earlier. But other than that, two hours should be the fine not line that you don't cross no matter what. Well, I'll say this. I know that they – the WWF actually – uh, wanted to do a two hour raw and USA network was like, look, we want three hours of programming. We will pay you for three hours of programming as opposed to two. And the WWF kind of felt like they had no choice, but I mean, it's what USA wants. So I guess it's what they're going to get. But me as a fan, I feel like, you know, three hours every single week is just ridiculous. But anyway, Thomas, your turn to, to pick a question. We got some really good ones, by the way. I want to thank everyone. Yeah, they're, they're actually some really good questions on here. And what I want to do here, I'll go, I'll go to Sonny Martinez. After WrestleMania, Mick Foley turned heel with Vince and challenged Stone Cold for the title as Austin's first program. Was heel dude love the correct choice, or would you have used someone different or even a different face of Foley? Well, to that answer, I, I would certainly, if I had to pick a Foley, it would have probably had been, I'd have probably stuck with dude love because mankind had kind of, worn out his welcome a little bit with the WWF, even though he came back just a few months later in that feud The Undertaker and, and with Kane. Uh, the Cactus Jack thing seems like it was kind of a ripoff of WCW slash ECW. So Dude Love was a bit different. Now, should it have been Foley in the first place? Looking at the heel roster here, like who do you really have? You have Triple H, who seems like the ready-made person for that, but Again, he had just gotten off a program with Owen Hart with the European title. I don't think he was ready for that spot yet. Uh, you have The Rock, same thing. Uh, I don't think he, they just had a program with Austin for the Intercontinental title at the end of 97. So I don't think he was ready for it. You have Kane, who was in the middle of something with The Undertaker at the time. So you really couldn't have thrown him in there. You know, he had a brief run with Austin uh, and actually won the title for a night in June of 98 at King of the Ring, which I was at. So really, what's that leave you down with? It doesn't leave you the whole hell of a lot. You have Invader, Goldust. I mean, there, there's not really anyone really. 
as a top marketable heel other than Mick Foley, who could actually bring tickets and sell them into the building. So is it ideal? Probably not if, with Dude Love at that time. But I think given the, the time frame that we're in, the spring of 1998, I think he was the best choice at that moment. Thomas, those are excellent points, and I have I have a lot to say about this, and I actually have a strong opinion. Uh, thank you, Sonny, for the question. I thought Dude Love was the perfect, and I mean perfect, opponent for Steve Austin. Steve Austin is coming off winning the title at WrestleMania. Now we have a slightly less important pay-per-view coming up than WrestleMania. Um, you know, it's, it's a lower-grade pay-per-view. The episode of TV where Mick Foley comes out with his dude love gear in his hands and just says, I am not wearing this crap anymore. I have a family. I'm not coming out here with strippers. And Vince McMahon comes out and just dangles the carrot in front of Mick Foley and gets his attention. Just like, hey, play ball, and you're going to get the what you want, a title match. And by the end of the program, Mick Foley is in his dude love gear, dancing around with a couple of strippers, and Vince McMahon taunts Steve Austin outside the ring by also doing the dude love dance. I thought it was an incredible episode of television, and I, I love what they did. Mick Foley made the most of what they gave him. He looked like a complete sellout doing what he did with Vince McMahon, and it made for great television, and I don't have the pay-per-view buy rate in front of me, but I'm sure it was more than satisfactory to the WWF. It's kind of wild because I think uh, you, you got the beginning part of Dude Love omitted there with, with in '98 because yes. what happened was the night after WrestleMania, they held up the tag team belt. It was Dude Love or Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie Terry Funk against the Outlaws in a steel cage. And that's when X-Pac and Triple H came in. They jumped Funk and they jumped uh, Mick Foley. The following week, Mankind did an empty arena promo, I want to say, saying how he was laying in the ring at the end of the show. You know, Tony Chimmel got on the microphone and said, fans, you know, don't leave yet. Steve Austin's coming out. And, and the crowd popped big. And he had basically said, you know what, I'm, I'm basically, I'm done. You know, this, this isn't for me anymore. You know, I'm, I'm laying there hurt, you know pouring my guts out for you fans and you fans are cheering for Austin while I'm laying there writhing in pain to hell with you. I quit. So the Austin McMahon match happens and then dude love comes out. McMahon's like, what the hell are you doing? And in fact, dude love attacks Vince McMahon. Austin tries to pull him off because he wants to beat McMahon up. And then dude love attacks Austin. And that's where the ball got rolling there. But again, is there, say, say Mick Foley injures himself in that match. Who's plan B? Because DX is already, to me, plan B has probably got to be Triple H. Yeah. But they've so yeah. far removed DX from, you know, they're trying to be the cool heels as opposed to being the corporate champion. It would need to be a complete 180. Because now keep in mind, we're a month away at this point in time from DX going and, and invading Nitro. So that all, that all gets thrown away then. Because you can't do that with, you know, the corporate champion working for McMahon, trying to fight Steve Austin, because you get too many cheers. You can't do The Rock right now because he's you know, starting to make his own way. Can you turn The Undertaker heel there? I mean, you did it with the corporate ministry, but I, I think that's still got a ways away, too. Same here. I think, really, other than Mick Foley, I think everything goes like a lead balloon here. Maybe, maybe Ken Shamrock is like Vince's hired gun, but even that's reaching. Yeah, you know what? You, you're making excellent points. It's, it is a good thing that Mick Foley did not have an injury that he could not work through, and, and it all came together. And I mean, you, you know, you're just reminding me of so many great things that happened in the late '90s in the WWF. I mean, I, I sit here and say, "Well, it doesn't hold up well," but I enjoyed the hell out of it when it when it was happening, and it was not traditional pro wrestling, as they say, but it was a, a heck of an entertaining product in my opinion 100 percent, and i think that's that's the best part of what that war did was it went from complete vince mcmahon autonomy to you know you had writers like russo you had people like Cornette and bruce pritchard able to input ideas 
and there were so many moving parts to that Vince had to let some things go through that normally he wouldn't, you know, be, be necessarily on board with. So, yes, he was the final say. Yeah, he was the, the gatekeeper for things that got on television 100%. But I think more got on just based on desperation. Yeah, you know, getting a little bit off subject, I mean, I miss the days when the wrestlers would sit in on the meetings and not have a, a say in the matter, but have input in the matter. Like you could tell, I mean, I, I know anyway, but you could tell Mick Foley had input into that feud. You could tell Shawn Michaels had, and Steve Austin, everyone had input into that. And that way you're, you're utilizing the wrestler's personality. Unlike today and the last at least 15 years where they just hand the wrestler a script and say, okay, memorize this and read it, and they have no input into their programs. I, I think the WWF, or now WWE, is missing out on that. You're absolutely right, and I think that, again, that gets part of the Monday Night War being over, and, and there not being any real direct competition. If you didn't give... Steve Austin, The Rock, Shawn Michaels, The Undertaker, any kind of creative leeway, you're just daring them to, to, to cross, the, cross the pond, so to speak, and go to WCW. At this point in time, if they go to AEW, you know, we, and we see it now, there, there's, they've let too many inmates run the asylum in AEW. It, it's, uh, there, there, there's no order there, as, you, as, I, as I've read. And, and people are, you know, wanting to come back. Look, look at Rusev, for example. He thought the grass was greener in AEW, signed a contract with them, and now he's just sitting at home getting a check. Do I think, you know, that screams that a lot of these guys will eventually, with the exception of probably Chris Jericho, because he's too pot committed, although I said the same thing about Cody Rhodes two years ago. Exactly. A lot of those guys, I think, will end up coming back because they appreciate the sense of order that the WWE has, meaning that it's not just everyone gets their own way. Everyone, everyone can be happy. Everyone gets a win on TV. It, it can't be that way. It, it can't be that everyone gets, everyone can't get over. Everyone can't be in the main event. Everyone can't wrestle on TNT in, in, the, in the main event slot every week. Someone's going to get their feelings hurt. And, and that group right there, I think the WWF, not necessarily castaways, but the guys who thought that there was going to be something better for them on the other side. I think Jericho's happy where he is now. I think John Moxley is happy where he is now. Everyone else, you know, I think they'll take a phone call if Triple H calls. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is something I know very little about. I, I don't have really an opinion, but I do have an opinion on this. There's one thing I know about everyone I've ever met in the business, they no one is getting a, a good enough push. Everyone is more talented than the push they are getting, no matter what that push is. And all of their friends are in the same boat. My friend is not getting the right push. My friend needs more TV time. It's just the way the wrestling business has always been. But anyway, Brandon Rice has a question. And once again, I have a lot to say on this. 1998 was the year of Stone Cold. Yes, it was. How did y'all see his rise, and did you ever think he'd be the megastar he became? Uh, I have a lot to say here, right? When I first saw Steve Austin in World Class Championship Wrestling, going back to 1989, when World Class was decidedly a, a minor league promotion by then, and we're, we're talking 89 and 90, I was like, WCW has to get this guy. He is going to be the next big thing. It was so obvious. He already he'd been in the ring for about a year, and he was a good worker. He was a good interview. He had charisma, etc. I was like ready for big things to happen for him. WCW finally signs him at the end of 1990, and I had people I know who were, had great wrestling minds who were asking me, you know, do you think do you really think he's ready? Well, the the obvious answer was, well, yeah, he's way outgrown Dallas. You don't want the WWF to get him first, and he was clearly ready for the push they gave him in early 91 with the TV title. Then time goes on, 
and he's not being used at all by WCW. Uh, I love the Hollywood Blondes, but I thought Brian Pillman was the star of that team. And Austin kind of gets moved as the guy who, if you want to have a good match in the middle of the card, we can have him, but that's, that's all he's good for. And Thomas, I fell for it. I know better. I know that if a wrestler is put in a bad situation, you know, he's not going to look good on TV. And WCW was the ultimate place. Make sure the wrong guy doesn't get over. And I, I completely forgot about it. I was like, you know, by 94, I was like, wow, I, I was wrong about Steve Austin. He's a good guy to have a, a middle, a mid card match that's good with. Then 95 comes around. They fire Steve Austin. Steve Austin goes, winds up in ECW. And I, I literally hit myself in the head. I'm like, you fell for it. Obviously, this guy is an immense talent. And it's just the WCW buried him. He gets to the WWF with that awful ringmaster gimmick with Ted DiBiase as his manager. There's another thing I've never been more wrong about. I thought Ted DiBiase was going to be a great manager. He wasn't even a good manager. I don't know what happened. He did great promos as Ted DiBiase, both as the million dollar man and as not. Uh, but for whatever reason, he just seemed to lose it. And again, I'm like, okay, Austin screwed. And then he finally came up with Stone Cold Steve Austin and the rest is history. He is arguably the, the biggest star in the history of wrestling. And I, Brandon, I always saw him as a big talent and sometimes they fooled me. Thomas, your, your thoughts on Steve Austin. Now, I always can, I always kind of lump Steve Austin in his USWA days and his uh, WCW time as, as a mid card guy, kind of a, a technician, kind of the gatekeeper to the, to the face that, you know, you know, chasing Ric Flair, for example. Like, so if Sting wanted to wrestle Ric Flair, he'd have to beat Steve Austin on a clash sort of. He gets to ECW and now I'll keep in mind, he had shown some charisma with Hollywood blonde, especially in their feud with, uh, Rick Flair and Arn Anderson, but they they didn't they, they never utilized it anymore. He always had you know whether it was Robert Parker or whether it was Paul Paulie Dangerously, he always had a talking piece for him, which kind of raised a red flag for me. Gets the ECW, does a little run there, entertaining as hell promo. He gets to the WWF as the ringmaster gimmick, and I have seen at that point in time you know for almost a decade, great wrestlers come in get saddled with something stupid and are gone within a year and they never recover from it. And for all intents and purposes, that's what should have happened to Steve Austin. He should have been gone by the 1998 Royal Rumble and wrestling in back in WCW as a mid-card guy or in ECW or whatever it was. It shouldn't have worked. But somehow, the, basically the best thing that happened for him was, was Ted DiBiase leading the company. Because I, I truly think if D.B. Aussie didn't leave, they would just keep beating their head against the wall with Austin trying to get him over as the ringmaster. I, I, I do believe that. I could be wrong. I could be, that could not be the case at all. But thankfully it didn't. Austin wins King of the Ring because of the, the, the curtain call because he was going to go to Triple H, but then he got punished for that. So Steve Austin, it kind of falls in his lap again. So then he has the ball runs so that he gets the feud with Bret Hart. Once he had the feud with Bret Hart, I knew he was going to be a big star in the WWF. I had no idea. Even post-Rumble, post-WrestleMania, I had zero idea at that time he would still become the big star that he became. That, it was, his whole career from 96 to 98, and I don't want to diminish what he did because it was phenomenal, but it was lightning in a bottle. When you think of the things that could have, the simple things that could have happened, like D.B. Aussie staying or the curtain call not happening, that would have derailed Steve Austin's career. What if Brian Pillman doesn't get the serious injury? Do they bring them, do they make them a tag team? Do they just have them have a mid card feud? How many things happened to benefit Steve Austin that could have easily gone the other way? That, I mean, that's a really good point. You're right. A lot of, th I mean, just everything went right and a lot of things happened that could or didn't happen that could have derailed Steve Austin. I mean, you know, I mean, I just remember him being an ECW 
and them calling him Superstar Steve Austin. And I was like, bang, this is the thing that's going to get him over big in the WWF or WCW if he ever wants to go there. And then he shows up in the WWF, and according to Austin himself, he saw Pulp Fiction uh, with uh, Bruce Willis with the shaved head, and he shaved his head. And I agreed with what Dave Meltzer said. I I thought when he shaved his head, he shaved his charisma. He did not look like anything special out there without the hair. And and once again, I've never been more wrong. The fans totally eventually bought into that look with the goatee, of course. But that, that, you know, that became the style in the late nineties. Guys with perfectly good heads of hair were shaving them because that was the in look. Right. And then obviously you got the, the carbon copy of Bill Goldberg later on in nineteen yes. ninety well not, yes. late ninety seven as well. We ready to move on to the next one? We sure are. Matt Crowder. If Doctor Death didn't get injured in the brawl for all and feud with Steve Austin, which is he put in there, would it be a memorable feud that we would be talking about today? And what Matt means, I believe, is Doctor Death was, you know, shoehorned into the brawl for all to win it and get a main event push. Of course, Bart Gunn knocked him out and, and killed his WWE career dead on arrival. But supposedly, the expectation was that Dr. Death was going to win the brawl for all and use that to catapult him into a main event run with Steve Austin. The only thing, when you look at the pieces, and, that, and that's the thing here, if, if Steve Williams, Dr. Death, is getting that spot He's taking the spot from someone else. There can't be two Steve Austin main events in, in the fall of 98 and everything else. So he's in, someone's out. I look at Steve Williams, Dr. Death's trajectory, as being if he wins the brawl for all, he gets the spot the big boss man had in the, in, in the WWF. Being Vince McMahon's bodyguard and forester sort of thing, he might get a main event on a throwaway pay-per-view but it's not going to be this memorable feud. He's eating the stunner with Jerry Briscoe and with Shane McMahon and everyone else. And it would be quickly forgotten about John. No, I I mean, I actually have to, I actually put two questions together. Matt's question about Steve Williams and uh, Michael Hulse question about Ken Shamrock. Ken Shamrock wrestled the rock for the IC title at the Royal Rumble and came up short based on a reverse decision. Do you think his career path had gone differently if he'd won it? You know, what difference would we have seen in the rock's career? And I kind of lump Shamrock and Steve Williams together. Uh, 1998 WWF was just not going to be their specialty. There was a time when I thought it could be. There was a time when I thought, okay, maybe to counter what WCW is doing, the WWF would be more like an All Japan, New Japan, uh, kind of a, a, a UFC, except it's worked type promotion. And that's when, that's when I thought Ken Shamrock was going to be over really big. And Steve Williams, again, same kind of guy, but, the, the direction the WWF wound up going in was definitely not up either guy's alley. And I, I, I don't think, I think if Steve Williams had won the brawl for all as they, you know, thought he was going to, uh, I don't think we, we would have seen a memorable feud. I, you know what, Thomas, you made a good point. He would have been the big, bo- he would have gotten the push the big boss man got. But you brought up the, the, uh, the infamous brawl for all. One of my favorite moments during that were the fans chanting, we want wrestling as the real fights are going on. And secondly, that that knockout that Bart Gunn KO'd Steve Williams with was absolutely brutal. He literally almost took his head off. Steve was knocked knocked out and he, he tore his hamstring on the way down. So, you know, he was he was out on his feet for about a second until he hit the ground. Yeah, and with that, too, when when Kama, the godfather, got knocked out, he actually tore his ACL. It was so bad. But the one thing I remember from the Brawl for All was, I remember Steve Blackman was against Mark Marrow, and now Mark Marrow was a legit Golden Gloves boxer out of New York. So everyone thought, okay, Mark Marrow will, you know, he'll just jab and back away, jab and back away. Well, Blackman 
realize what the scoring system was and just kept tackling Mark Merrow. To where like Mara couldn't even throw a punch again. It was kind of like almost like a Noki versus Muhammad Ali, if you ever seen it, where there's not a lot of action except for just you know one guy's on the ground just trying to bring the person down. It got to the point where I recall the next round, Steve Blackman was re- replaced by someone else, and whether it was like one of the Quebecers or whether it was one of the Disciple DOA guys or one of the mid card guys in the lower end replaced Steve Blackman because apparently they just didn't want that on film anymore. Just a guy just tackling the other one and getting five points each time because how it worked was if you t- if you took down someone like a, a single leg takedown it counted the same as if you knocked out someone to an eight count with a right hand cross and that that makes perfect sense on on blackman's part just you know stay away from the guy and and, and take him down i mean I, I remember hearing about the brawl for all and okay, this is what's going to be on TV tonight and watching it. And I was skeptical when I first heard that the matches were going to be shoots. And when I saw them, I'm like, okay, this is definitely a shoot because it's not entertaining enough not to be. And after the first week, I was like, you know, Vince, you've got to be kidding me. Turn these into works. Say it's a shoot, but really make it a work so that it's entertaining and in the end of the day so that you get the result that you want. I mean, if the NBA was a shoot, the, a work, excuse me, the Lakers would be in the finals every year. If the NFL was a shoot, a work, excuse me, the Cowboys would be in the Super Bowl every year. So you have that advantage if you're running pro wrestling. You get the desired result, and in this case, the, the desired result was not Bart Gunn almost beheading Steve Williams. The other thing about it, too, that it made me realize was wrestling shape and boxing shape are two different animals. You're watching guys that routinely wrestle 12 to 15 minutes a night on a house show. They're doing one-minute rounds of boxing, and they're swallowing their tongues in the corner after the race. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. You're right. There is a, a big difference. And like you said, these guys were, were totally gassed one minute into it. All right. Mark Matsuo asks if from what you heard at the time, was there any way Hulk Hogan was going back to the WWF when his contract expired? Um, Mark, in a word, yes. And I was hearing at the time that it was a definite possibility. They may not have known what to do with Hulk Hogan in the WWF in 1998. He, you know, kind of didn't fit in. He fit in way better with WCW. But at the same time, it would have been worth it for the WWF just to take him away from WCW and make it look like, hey, this is the place where stars land, not WCW. And I, you know, I'm sitting here saying I don't know what the WWF could have done with Hulk Hogan in 1998. Well, they knew what to do with him in 2002, so I, I think they would have come up with him. But what I was hearing at the time, Mark, was that it was a definite possibility. See, I, I, I read the same stuff you did, obviously, John, but I, I'm skeptical. I think Hogan used it as a power play to get more money from WCW because in 1998, by that time, which I believe might have been the fall of 98, I could be wrong on the, on the dates there, but it's firmly Steve Austin's company at that point in time in terms of the top star. If Hogan comes in, he's going to either eat the stunner or he's going to be made to be a fool on television, whatever it is. That's not in Hogan's vocabulary at that point in his career. I don't think he's going to come in and be the foil for Austin. I don't think he's going to come in and be Austin's buddy. He's not going to feud with McMahon. I, wh- where does he fit in in terms of I, – I get that Vince and company would have found something for him. But what would have been out there for Hulk Hogan to walk away from WCW and do? That's the big question. And I don't think in 1998 – there was necessarily an offer or a promise or anything else that could have been given to him that would have been better than what he had with Turner. That's a really good point. You know, the more I think about this, I mean, in the WWF, Hulk Hogan, you know, sure, he would have had some say in creative and maybe there was a thing or two he could have said no to. 
But at the same time, he kind of would have had to work with the script, unlike WCW, where he did whatever he wanted. And there's just no question in my mind that he and Kevin Nash had kind of a side agreement that, hey, you know, I won't step on your toes if you don't step on mine. But together, we'll step on everyone else's. And Hogan got to do whatever he wanted. Bischoff was, you know, beholden to him. So, I mean, you know, not just talking about everything but money, you know, I, I can't imagine Hulk Hogan wanting to leave that environment for the WWF. And let's not forget here, this isn't 1986 WWF here, where you put Hulk Hogan on television once a year on the syndicated version, maybe twice a year on Saturday Night's main event. No, Hulk Hogan was going to have to slum it and wrestle the road dog on SmackDown. Like, that was going to happen. He, he was going to have to slum and, and, and wrestle, you know, Chris Jericho on an episode of Raw in the, you know, because you, you can't be just feuding with Austin and The Undertaker 24 7. And, and you watch the programming, there is some intermingling of the guys who are not at the very top of the card with the mid card at this point in time as well, too. Do you think Hulk Hogan is going to want to wrestle, um, let's think, you know, Jeff Jarrett on an episode of, on an episode of Raw? Of course not. So I, I think any idea, that Hogan would have had about coming there, it would have taken some kind of colossal, kind of colossal miscommunication, mishap, somehow getting screwed over by WCW for him to even entertain leaving. I, to this day, I believe that Vince McMahon was certainly interested. I believe that Hulk Hogan was certainly interested in what Vince McMahon had to offer because he would run back to Eric Bischoff and say, Vince is offering me this, 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 and this. Can you match it? And obviously, at that point in time in the war, Eric Bischoff would have said yes to almost anything. One of my favorite Hulk Hogan stories is back when Brian Pillman was doing the loose cannon gimmick in WCW. And Hogan, there was some match coming up in a cage. It was Hogan and Savage against like six heels that were, it was Kevin Sullivan and like five other heels. And Hogan saw that Pillman was getting over. Pillman, a guy who he had no alliance with, was getting over big with the loose cannon character. And he had Bischoff put, (laughs) put Pillman into this match to pour ice water on Brian Pillman, just like make him one of Sullivan's guys and I'll, I'll leg drop him in the cage. And then, and Bischoff does it and Pillman's like, Oh, I have an injury. I can't do that. And he winds up not doing it. I mean, just the ultimate WCW story right there. They brought in the entire dungeon of doom, the horsemen. And since there were, that, that wasn't enough heels for Hogan and Savage. They brought in Jeep Swenson and they brought in Zeus. And it all wasn't enough. We need Pillman in there to get him in the stew so he doesn't stand out. And Pillman's like, oh, I have an injury. Sorry. The ultimate WCW. Okay. Whose turn is it? It is your turn, sir. I I believe it is mine. Let me pull up the mailbag here one more time here. Let's go with Rick Nathan. Should WCW have waited to bring Bret Hart in until 1998? rather than terribly shoehorn him into 1997 Starcade like they did? And if so, how should they have brought him in for his debut? Yes and no, Rick. I think you need to bring him in immediately before his heat cools down from the WWF. I think you could say that he's not allowed to wrestle because of X, Y, and Z. That way you could say, is he NWO? Is he WCW? And and, and that's, that's a let the tides fall where they may, he should not have been involved in Starcade 97 under any capacity. That includes the Larry Zabisco, Eric Bischoff match. And that especially includes the finish to Hulk Hogan and Sting. I think when he actually had his first match, I believe it was with Ric Flair at sold out, which I think could have been the best program for him to begin with by using the WWF logic. I beat you for the world title, and then you left. You know, why are you running from me, Rick? You know, that's where – and use that view. And is Brett NWO? Brett's fighting a WCW guy. He's fighting the, the cornerstone of WCW. He must be NWO. You keep that question going 
for a few months, and then he either aligns with one or the other, and you do it that way. But in, again, I stress in no way, shape, or form should he have been a part of WCW Starcade 97 at all. Well, my, my answer is similar. I mean, I think they should have put him on TV right away. Hey, remember that guy who was WWF champion just a few weeks ago? He's one of us now. We signed him away from that minor league uh, promotion they've got in, uh, up in Connecticut. As far as, you know, Bret Hart, how they should have used him, um, I would have put him on TV right away. And when I say right away, the 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 day his contract ended with the WWF, I would have had some special on TNT. Uh, you know, Bret Hart arriving in in is here in WCW. Even if it's just a half an hour thing where they sit there and talk to Bret Hart. I would have put that right out there. As far as you know, whether or not to use him at Starcade, I mean, I would have at least had him do an interview segment. I don't think I would have put him in the mix right away as a, a referee. Uh, with the Hogan and Sting match. I, I would not have done that, but, you know, Brandon, this has been a common theme in this show. Bret Hart is just an excellent example of, okay, we're going to book this guy and make sure he doesn't get over the way he's supposed to get over. He's, we're not going to push him in front of Hogan. We're not going to pu- push him in front of Nash. This guy is getting kneecapped, and that's what happened to Bret Hart in WCW. And I think, I think Brett realized that pretty early on. Yes. That the politics in WCW were terrible. And had it not been for Owen, his untimely death, and the injury he suffered from Goldberg, there is no question in my mind. Brett would have been, what, 43 whenever WCW? Exactly 43. Yeah. So what, you know, when you talk about, you know, if you did the invasion angle over again and you took Shane and Stephanie McMahon out of it, who would have been the face of WCW? Eric Bischoff, Ric Flair. What about Bret Hart? As saying, you tried to, you tried to kill me once and for all, Vince McMahon, but you couldn't do it. Now I'm back to get you sort of thing. It take you know, it, it takes someone to know you to finally put you out of your misery sort of thing. I like and, that. And, well, no, because that would have been believable then. Because the whole, the whole narrative was the reason why the invasion angle failed was because people that watched Raw were loyal to Raw and didn't know these WWE mid-card guys. Well, yeah, hell, I didn't know who, who Mike Sanders was and, and, and Chuck Palumbo. And I was even watching this stuff at the time you know, a little bit irregularly, but watching it. Had you put Bret Hart in front of it or Ric Flair in front of it, it, it could have worked. But, but I'm, I'm going off on a, on, a, on a sidebar tangent here. But, but that being said, Bret's career – was really hamstrung, and I and I don't blame Vince McMahon at all for it because I think he wanted a fresh start in WCW. They just wouldn't give it to him. No, first of all, I, I love your idea about Brett being part of the invasion and saying, you know, Vince, I know you, and I'm the guy who can destroy you. Um, I mean, I've said this before. As soon as I saw the Montreal screw job, uh, I was saying, if I'm Brett's agent, I'm like, you know, you're going to do your three years in WCW, and then you are coming back here. This is where the money is for you. And if Brett's like, no, Vince screwed me. I don't want to. I'm like, Brett, listen to me. You've got three whole years to calm down about this. It's just business. You know, you're coming back here in three years. I, I felt sorry for Brett, like in the late nineties when you could tell his career was really going nowhere with WCW that, you know, once again, God forbid the wrong guy get over because at the end of his run in the WWF, I, I really truly believe that Vince no longer wanted Bret Hart as part of the company. I think, you know, Bret was kind of bullheaded. He said no to a lot of things and the WWF was going in a direction that, that Bret really didn't fit into. But and one thing, you know, we talk about the WCW invasion. I remember watching Rex, WrestleMania X7. Thomas, I think I talked about this with you and they have the WCW wrestlers in a suite and they put the camera on it and it just says WCW wrestlers. You don't see any faces, nothing I'm like this. They're, they are so going to blow this. And they did. Well, even worse than that, if I recall correctly, the two wrestlers that you can see kind of plain as they on camera were Lance Storm and Chavo Jr. And if you had probably put them on the screen and you know, on, on, a, on a Chiron with their names on them, He'd be like, well, who the hell are those guys? So they, 
they, they probably shouldn't have done that at all. I mean, I get, you know, Nash, Hall, Hogan, Goldberg, Flair, they were all going to sit their contracts out. And WWF being public at the time, they couldn't pay a hundred cents on the dollar to, to, to bring them back in and make them whole. So I, I don't know what you do. Maybe, maybe you have ECW as the original invasion and you vanquish them. And in that time, contracts start to expire and you bring guys in from WCW and do the real angle. I don't know what you do on that one, short of paying everybody their full contract worth, which would have made people in the locker room insanely jealous. And it would have, it, it, those guys would have been a cancer and it would have probably killed the invasion angle dead anyway. Now, you see, I would have done it differently. I would have taken the contracts and I would have told everyone in the locker room, look, this is what we had to do to facilitate, facilitate the sale. We had no say in the matter when the contracts expire. These guys are going to get WWF deals, but right now we have to pay them what someone else promised them. And I, I think it's, it's the WWF. Clearly they can afford to pay Hogan, Flair, Nash, et cetera, and, and do this entire uh, invasion angle thing the right way. And you can also go back on if one of these guys is extremely uncooperative, which probably would have happened, you have the basis to terminate their contract. I mean, I've I've been saying this since 2001, you know, that if you're going to do an invasion angle, you can't do it with with Stephanie McMahon as the as the, you know, the lead per- antagonist for the other side. Well, I, I think the invasion angle, too, was killed because the original story goes that it was going to be Monday Nitro on Monday nights and then SmackDown on Thursday nights. But Spike TV said, no, 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 no. We paid for Monday Night Raw. We're going to get Monday Night Raw. And that's apparently what just said, okay, we're just going to kill the whole thing here within two or three months. That that did happen. They tried to get a, a Monday night show on a different network. They did offer it to uh, USA or whoever it was, uh, TNN. And, you know, they offered it to them and like, hey, if you do this, you won't have any competition on Monday nights. Don't you understand? And TNN was like, no, we're paying for Monday Night Raw. You're giving us Monday Night Raw. And they they tried to get uh, another national cable outlet to take uh, the Monday Night Raw and just no one would do it. They didn't want to become the wrestling channel, which is too bad because they were still doing good ratings. Yeah, I mean, if you look at what Nitro was doing at the very end, like a, you know, I'll ballpark a 2-2 two, two to a 2-4, whatever it was, the WWE would probably kill for that right now for Monday Night Raw in 2023. And that's what put WCW out of business was, was, was the low ranking, low ratings rather. And well, more than anything, the financial mismanagement of, of the whole program, especially with the contracts and everything else. So back, back to Bret Hart. When you look at his programs that he had in WCW, it almost seems like, with the exception of Goldberg, he sort of handpicked his opponent. He didn't have any, well, not, not no extended run-ins with guys like Kevin Nash or guys like Hogan. He did have some programs with them, but mainly it was Ric Flair, Chris Benoit, you know, guys guys that could work in the ring. And Brett's always been kind of a, guy, a work rate guy, you know, through WWF, through his entire career. So it makes perfect sense there. So maybe he didn't want to – I don't want to speak for Brett, but I think at a certain point in time, he just wanted to, you know, have his matches, take the check. He didn't really care about being the top star anymore. It, it sort of felt like that. It, you know, it sort of felt like, you know, when sick, not even six months into his run with WCW, he figured out that, okay, I'm going to do what everyone else does. Just, I'm just going to take the money and not worry about it. We've got maybe one minute left. We can go a little bit over time. I'll answer Eric Perkins question regarding Bret Hart. Uh, well, it's sort of about Bret Hart. Although Bret Hart's WCW booking and creative was mismanaged, do you think it would have been wiser to build him up through Throughout the year, and to be the one to beat Goldberg and win the title and end the streak at Starcade '98 instead of Nash. 
couple of things. Number one, I don't think that streak was ready to be over by Starcade 98. Uh, I think they should have milked that at least a couple of more months, maybe even a few more months. Number two, I definitely don't think it should have been Kevin Nash. And we all know the, the game Kevin Nash was playing there to once again pour cold water on Goldberg. And it worked. His, his nickname was Coldberg by the middle of 99. But who would we have done – who would I have eventually built up to break the streak? I would have gone with a much younger wrestler than either Bret Hart or uh, Kevin Nash. I would have gone – my second pick, and this is more like a 1A pick, would have been Booker T. Booker T just had incredible athleticism, and as he showed in his career with the World Wrestling Federation, he had charisma and was good in front of the mic. He just never really got to show those off in WCW. That's a 2020 hindsight pick. My 1A pick would have been Chris Jericho, who I have always been a a big fan of. I've always thought he was a, an amazing talent, and he got to show it a little bit in WCW, but he really got to show it in the WWF and I was you know since his Smoky Mountain days I was always really impressed with Chris Jericho and that's the guy I would have put the rocket on how about you Thomas you know what unpopular opinion here I would have stayed with Kevin Nash Things okay of doom stuff aside if you're giving Kevin Nash, and I'll tell you why Kevin Nash was insanely over at the time he was Bill Goldberg's star was starting to fall and I remember it vividly because I was in high school at the time on Monday Nitro, you could tell that the Goldberg chants were piped in when they sound exactly the same, whether it's in Biloxi, Mississippi, or St. Paul, Minnesota. They all sound exactly the same. The same and they sounded fake. <laughs> right. But I remember a kid, uh, uh, you know, someone my age with a sign right on the aisle saying, before Starcade, getting old, Berg. <laughs> and I knew that – I knew that there was – and obviously there's contrarian fans and everything, but you could tell that – some of the shine was off of Bill Goldberg. So you needed a guy to get the title off of him then so you could rebuild him. Because the last thing you want to do is just have Goldberg have that go away heat. Gold, you know, sort of like what John Cena had in the late 2000s where he's just beating everybody. The reason why I pick Nash, though, is I get it. You can have Bret Hart. You can have Jericho. You can have Benoit. But how do those guys beat Bill Goldberg when you've booked yourself into a corner where he's beating the giant in 30 seconds with the jackhammer. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, and not that I would do that. I would not have had him beating the giant in 30 seconds, but you can't unring the bell, as they say. Right. So now you're stuck in a corner because now if Bret Hart beats him, if Jericho or Booker T beats him, I'm like, what the hell's the giant then? <laughs> you know, what, what, what have we done with him now? What have we done with Kevin Nash? What have we done with, you know, Diamond Dallas Page? You know, guys you build up, and now Bret Hart's going to be the one that beats him? But now once Goldberg is beaten, now he has that, that, that you know, mark on his armor where, you know, he can be beaten by theoretically anybody. But until then, it's got to be a bona fide story. It's got to be a guy that's over. I, I say stick with Kevin Nash minus the finger poke. All right, I can see that. Well, Thomas, once again, I want to thank you for for filling in this week. I really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, you know, public thanks to you. We things have been a little bit up in the air uh, due to the flooding in Northern California, and you know, Thomas, one from the heart, man. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure, John. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, and I want to once again apologize for my voice. I'm blowing, I'm trying to get the words out, and this cold just is unrelenting. Hopefully, the next time we record, this will not be an, an issue. I want to thank Brian Last for giving me this forum. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does. And Lord knows he's got plenty on his plate right now, but he's going to, he's recording with us right now and he's going to produce the show. And I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank everyone for listening. We'll be back next week. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. This concludes our podcast day.